Madison, Judge Wright, he's a graduate of Drake Law School. Uh, he's our, our newest judge, and uh, we're pleased to have him on the board. He, uh, he just recently finished uh, a kind of a whole high profile uh, jury trial here in Burlington, Des Moines County that was reported on regularly in the Burlington Hawkeye. You may have read about it. Uh, Judge Wright, uh, it's, uh, he, he uh, came tonight even though he wasn't feeling particularly well uh, earlier today. We really appreciated that. And Judge Wright has a unique uh, perspective on a lot of things. He, uh, he's married, has four children. He also previously served as the uh, mayor of Fort Madison, Iowa. His uh, father was uh, one of the very best trial lawyers in the uh, state of Iowa. Justice Waterman, did you try cases against uh, George Wright, I'm sure. He's outstanding. Yeah, very, very outstanding trial lawyer. We're pleased to have Judge Wright uh, as our colleague on the bench. Now, Judge Wright. Folks, uh, since I'm the last speaker for tonight, I knew that there would be less than 30 minutes to speak. <laughs> which is fine because uh, that means uh, I won't take any of your questions. Uh, <laughs> actually, I want audience participation because uh, before Justice Waterman got on the Supreme Court, uh, and I've only practiced, uh, I practiced 20 years, before becoming a judge, I've been on the bench now for two years. I'm the youngest. I mean, I was born after 1962. So I don't know how you all selected judges before I was born. But uh, at, at the Iowa Supreme Court and the Iowa Court of Appeals, uh, there are two button or two lights, a red light and a yellow light. And all of you lawyers here tonight know uh, the fear of not completing the answer to your question before that red light comes on, because you have to then say to the justices, uh, I see my time has expired, may I finish my answer? Usually it was no when I asked the question. So uh, when I get to 8.29, everybody raise your hand so I know that it's time to stop. That's the yellow light and I will stop on the red. Uh, the reason you're all here tonight uh, is to listen to uh, scholars of the law talk about uh, the Constitution, separation of powers, uh, why our country is as great as it is because of the documents that, that are the foundation. Uh, so, uh, since you've already heard all that, I'll talk about now what are you going to do if you decide you're going to stop being the law-abiding citizens that you are and uh, go out and commit heinous crimes and, and then hire all these fine lawyers who are here tonight. Uh, I started off with a five-page outline. You have that. And because uh, I thought, well, I'm not going to have that long to talk, or nobody's really going to want to listen to all of it, I got it down to five bullet points. So now I'm just going to say, uh, let's talk about whatever you want to talk about. The, the process for your constitutional rights in the criminal law sector of our society is this. You basically have the right to remain silent and the right to a lawyer. I mean, everybody, that's basic, right? Before Miranda came out, we were talking about it earlier tonight, the due process uh, requirements in the criminal matter. What we all know from watching TV, uh, or going to a trial where somebody is the criminal defendant, that there are certain rights uh, that you are given as a U.S. citizen, uh, or somebody who is visiting here from another country. You have the right to remain silent. And uh, because I have young children, I watch Shrek and, and all the Shrek uh, sequels. And I think it was Shrek 2 where uh, Shrek said to a donkey, you have the right, right to remain silent. What you lack is the ability <laughs> to remain silent. So, you know, uh, it's tempting to stand up here and talk about uh, what you should and shouldn't do when you're arrested, but we've got at least one prosecutor here tonight and several criminal defense attorneys, and you're free to ask uh, all these men and women the questions because they know uh, uh, the advice you give. But um, uh, when, you, when you're stopped by police, for example, and this is in the outline, uh, you, have to, you have to have done something. I mean, the best thing about this country is you can't just be stopped by the police and asked, what are you doing? Where are you going? You got anything in your pocket? Let's look in the trunk of your car. Because as the other uh, judges were talking about tonight, uh, the forefathers brought forth a constitution uh, that included uh, amendments uh, that uh, protect our liberties. So uh, there has to be a reason to stop you. And there really has to be a reason to look through your car. 
My older two kids uh, were just thrilled when I gave them the advice. If you're ever stopped by the police, don't say, yeah, you can check through my car. You no, don't give them consent, I would say. Now, first of all, kids, don't have anything in that car that you shouldn't let the police see. But if you do, just say, no, you can't look in the, in the car. The other part to that is, you don't know what's in your car if you're giving a ride to one of your friends. They may have something that they just stashed under the seat so that they don't get in trouble. But there are reasons for stopping you. You have to have probable cause if you're law enforcement. You have to have a reason or a consent to look through a car. And it applies to our homes. I mean, how many times have uh, the appellate courts and the district courts uh, taken up the issue of uh, unlawful search and seizure? And we were talking about exceptions to uh, uh, an unlawful search. Trials can be won, or criminal cases can be won or lost in the pretrial uh, phase. And uh, if you have an attorney that files a, uh, a motion to suppress evidence that was illegally obtained, uh, that not only can win your case, but if you don't win on that motion, you've created an appellate record so that jo uh, Ju Judge Miller or Justice Waterman have an opportunity to pass on that decision. And, and uh, basically, you preserve for your appeal a very important right, and that is uh, you think that the law enforcement stepped um, beyond their boundaries and uh, searched when they shouldn't have or where they shouldn't have. Well, let's just say for uh, sake of uh, beating the light here tonight that you've been charged, and now what's going to happen to you? Uh, the uh, uh, police uh, will uh, give you either a promise to appear, which means you uh, basically say, I'm going to show up in another week or two to do my initial appearance. Or uh, you will be arrested and you'll go in front of the magistrate or the judge the next day and he or she will set a bond or release you on your own recognizance or some method of securing your attendance at the next hearing. The uh, prosecutor will uh, either hold a preliminary hearing or file a trial information. In the 20 years that I uh, was fortunate enough to practice uh, criminal defense law, there was one preliminary hearing. Otherwise, it's always uh, satisfied by filing a trial information. And the trial information is uh, the charge or the charges that you will stand trial on. So you're told what your charge is, and then you're also told in the minutes of testimony who are the witnesses that are going to testify against you. Now, uh, again, uh, after uh, you have uh, been advised of your right to an attorney, uh, if you've hired one or if you don't have the money to hire one, you're appointed one, uh, you need to meet with that lawyer and talk about how you're going to prepare this case. Because one of two things is going to happen. Either one, you're going to trial, and you need to be ready. Because if you demand your right to speedy trial, that's going to be within 90 days. Okay, that's going to be a quick 90 days, too. You waive your right to a speedy trial, whether you're sitting in jail or not. You know, it could be up to a year before you go to trial. It depends on the docket. But you've got to talk to your lawyer because he or she is the one that's going to stand in the way of you being convicted. They're the ones that are going to be up there in the court uh, pre-trial arguing these motions. They're going to be the ones at trial who are arguing uh, that the state doesn't have uh, sufficient evidence for the jury to be firmly convinced of your guilt. So you need to be aware of uh, the importance that your lawyer plays in the process. Uh, and, and you have to understand, too, that there's attorney-client privilege. What you say to your lawyer, for the most part, is kept in confidence. I say for the most part because the second thing that could happen is that you go to uh, court and plead guilty. Now, as, as the other judges, and uh, I would venture to guess all the lawyers in this room tonight have done in the past, I've spoken to high school classes. Uh, I got to speak to a journalism class at Iowa. And almost to the, to the instance, uh, the same question is asked. And this is, you know, as a lawyer, I was asked, well, how can you represent somebody who's guilty? And maybe that question is on your mind, and I see, you know, some other lawyers nodding their head, yeah, yeah I'm asked that all the time. Well, my answer to that was, because I no longer have asked that question, was, I don't ask. I don't ask. Ah, look, if you killed that person, don't tell me. Because unless you're going to plead guilty or something else comes up that I really need to know, 
If you go on the stand and testify, you told me you killed that person, you get on the stand and you testify you did not kill that person, we've got an ethical dilemma. Uh, and since nobody's getting ethics CLE tonight, I won't go into that. But the point is, you got to be open and honest with your attorney, but your attorney may not ask you every question you want your attorney to ask you. You don't want to volunteer you did it, necessarily. Because the second thing that could happen, though, is that you go to court and you plead guilty. I don't know what the percentage is, but it's well over 90%. I would venture to guess 95% or above the number of cases that settle before trial. And what I mean by that is uh, you're making a deal with the prosecution. The prosecution might offer you a charging concession. So instead of burglary in the second degree, uh, you plead guilty to burglary in the third degree. It's the difference between 10 years and 5 years in prison. Uh, or they may make a sentencing concession, or both. Sentencing concession, uh, for example, look, if you plead guilty to burglary in the third degree, we'll recommend a suspended sentence so you don't go to prison. If you take a guilty plea, uh, there is no guarantee what your sentence will be when that judge gets up there uh, six weeks or so after you enter your guilty plea. Uh, there, are, uh, there is a limited situation where you can bind the court's hands, but again, the court ultimately has the decision whether the person goes to prison or the person uh, is put on probation. So uh, if you uh, do go to trial, uh, keep in mind that you as the criminal defendant do enjoy a very important right, and that is the right to remain silent even at that stage. Because no one from the government can force you to testify against yourself. And if you don't testify at your trial, the prosecutor cannot comment upon the fact that you did not testify at your trial. Um, and so the, the right to remain silent stems from uh, the, the point in which law enforcement first uh, stops you right up to the end when the jury is going to get your case. Uh, in my outline, of course, it's, it may be obvious to all of you, but I've tried to be very um, general in the outline. If you are if found not guilty, you walk. Uh, if you're found guilty, uh, for certain crimes, you'll be held in jail until you uh, come up for sentencing. Uh, otherwise, your sentencing hearing will be held, and um, uh, depending upon the level of charge, your criminal background, of convictions, uh, other factors that uh, weigh in your favor or against you that come out through an investigation by the Department of Correctional Services, uh, the court will make a decision what's the appropriate sentence. And then, of course, uh, you have the right to appeal. And if you file your notice of appeal within 30 days, then uh, very knowledgeable, very kind, very thoughtful uh, justices and judges will make the decision whether uh, the um, judge did something wrong, whether your attorney did something wrong, whether the jury was wrong. That there's there's uh, all sorts of uh, examples of how the appellate courts can overturn a conviction. And, and again, we're talking about the safeguards of checks and balances tonight in our constitutional form of government. We have checks and balances within the judiciary in the sense that uh, those uh, men and women who have in the merit system proven themselves worthy to be on the Supreme Court and the Court of Appeals will uh, take another look at cases that come before them that appear in front of district court judges. And while none of us are perfect, as Judge Brown said, we do make mistakes, we know that there is a, a checks and balances, if you will, with the appellate court system. Um, nobody has raised their hand yet to tell me it's time to stop. About five minutes? Great. So I've left enough time for you to ask uh, a question that I'll really be sorry uh, you asked because I won't have any answer to all that. But um, any questions about the criminal defense sector? And I know there are criminal defense lawyers out there, so no fair asking a question about your case. <laughs> None. Well, I know you all want to go. Uh, yes, sir. Mr. Beckman. Yeah. By the way, I'm an attorney, uh, and I, don't, I haven't done criminal law in 20 years. But I've also been asked that question. Uh, how do you defend somebody's guilty? And I, I, you know, what do you do? Well, what you have to remember is they're not all guilty. I, uh, most of them might be guilty every once in a while, and I've had some years ago. They're not guilty, and somebody needs to stand up in front of the judge and jury and say, my guy is guilty. I want to thank you, Mr. Beckman, and I'll tell you just one real quick story, and this is, this is one of my favorites, and Judge Brown uh, knows this 
one too. Uh, I enjoy doing criminal defense law because uh, on the other side, we're fine people. There's a prosecutor in the back that really made it fun to, to work in the courtroom. And uh, we finished with a trial uh, one day, and I won. <laughs> It was such a rare occasion. Um, I uh, went up to the prosecutor who was not here tonight, and I, and I shook her hand. And, and I think that's what all the lawyers should do after a trial, before the jury comes back with a decision, is shake each other's hands, tell each other you did a fine job. Because while we can be opponents in the courtroom, we should be civil towards each other. And uh, I shook her hand, and I said, good job. And she said, nice job. And I went to shake the hand of the uh, law enforcement officer. He wouldn't take my hand. He says, I have no use for you or any other criminal, criminal defense lawyer. Uh, which just, I mean, made me feel really good. <laughs> because I won. Uh, but uh, the point is, what Mr. Beckman is saying is absolutely correct. The men and women uh, who go out there and defend those who don't have a nickel to pay for their services, or who are wealthy as any CEO, um, they deserve the protections that are afforded to all of us under the Constitution. And so congratulations to the, the men and women who prosecute the cases in a fair and ethical manner and do justice under the law, and to those men and women who stand up for everyone, regardless of their position in society, and support our rights uh, under the Constitution. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you very much.